We have all of these problems that uh, on this planet that are caused by, by human technology. And so the solution, of course, is more technology to solve the problems caused by previous technology. So we have climate change. Well, you know, let's put big mirrors in space or let's seed the ocean with iron uh, to absorb carbon or let's, um, you know, do something to the clouds, you know, and, and, and thinking that, that this won't have unintended consequences and that we can continue using the same tools and the same mindset, the same kind of instrumentalist mindset of, of technology and get somehow different results. Um, and I think that a lot of people are, are seeing the bankruptcy of that way of approaching our problems. Uh, that you know, we're understanding that, that if we use the same means toward different goals, we're actually going to end up with more of the same, as, as Einstein pointed out. Um, yeah, it's, it's rather insane <laughs> to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Uh, so we need a deeper, kind of, a deeper kind of change. And the way I've been describing the change that we need um, is that we, that, that we need and we are actually um, approaching a transition in our, in our stories or a transition in our mythology. The basic narratives and agreements and symbols that we use to understand the world and upon which our whole society is built. Part of the, because our belief in a technological fix um, comes from a certain worldview. And, and what is that worldview? It's the same worldview that all of our other systems are built on, including the financial system, our educational system, our criminal justice system, uh, political system, uh, medical system. You know, all of these things are built on a common foundation. And the fact that, that all of these institutions are in a state of crisis speaks to the um, obsolescence of the underlying story, the underlying mythology. You know, every, every culture, every civilization has what you could call a story of the people that explains why we're here, um, what the purpose of human beings is, and, and who we are, even, and what's important, and what's valuable, and where we came from, and where we're going. And our story, it has two different dimensions. One is a story of self that, that says, who am I as an individual? And the other is a story of the people or a story of the world that says, who are we? And ours, for in the West especially, but to some extent everywhere that has uh, engaged in civilization, our, our story has been that, that well, what you are is a separate individual in an external universe. Um, you are, you know, a bubble of psychology bouncing around um, among other bubbles of psychology inside kind of these flesh robots. Um, that you are an individual uh, seeking, and there's other individuals out there, so these others, they're not you, so you're kind of in competition with them. Their, their, their interest is not your interest. Their well-being is not your well-being. And in fact, it might even be that their sickness would be to your advantage because that's one less competitor in this indifferent external universe. In this story, where does security come from? It comes through controlling this outside world, insulating yourself from these forces that are indifferent to your well-being. Um, in that view, the more control that you can exercise, the more knowledge you have about the external workings of the world and the more power, the more force you have at your disposal to control that external world, the safer you'll be. Now, these methods are, um, we, don't, we don't believe in, in them as much anymore. And our ability to control uh, is revealed at least in part as an illusion. Um, we can control some things, but there's always things that escape our control. And when we see that, we think the solution must be that our control isn't complete yet, but one more invention, one more scientific breakthrough 
Maybe it's nanotechnology. Maybe it's genetic engineering. And then we'll finally become the masters of the universe. And I think that, that most of us aren't believing in that anymore. And we're trans transitioning into a very different story. A story that has, I would call it a new story, except that it's actually a very ancient story. Um, what's new is bringing it into a mass society um, with a global division of labor and, 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 every, and you know, having gone through everything we've been through in the last few millennia. Um, and of course, that's, that, that new and ancient story is, you could call it, um, inner being, interconnectedness. I like Thich Nhat Hanh's phrase, uh, inner being. You know, that, that says, yeah, you're not the separate individual, but, but we're part of everything that is, and everything that is is part of us. And that what happens to you is happening to me. And what we do to the world, we're doing to ourselves inescapably, and we cannot, through any technology, manage forever the consequences. And that leads itself to a very different um, relationship to each other and a different relationship to the world. All of the the suffering today, it's a matter of our perceptions, our agreements. You know, why are there one why do one in three people go hungry on this planet? Is it because there's not enough food? No, it's because there's not enough money. But money is something that we could create infinite amounts of. Money is just numbers. So it's because the food isn't distributed to the people who are hungry. Uh, or their ability to produce food has been destroyed by various forms of cultural and economic imperialism. But we, don't have, we have no fundamental scarcity. Uh, if we didn't devote huge amounts of our time and energy and, and wealth toward creating armaments, you know, I mean, that's not something that's really necessary for human well-being either. So, so you know, it's a matter of, of changing our perceptions or changing our story. Maybe all of the greed and selfish, selfishness that we see, that's a response to this artificial scarcity that we've created. Maybe our true nature is that we are put onto this planet having received tremendous gifts, the gift of life, the gift of breath, the gift of the sun, of the water, and having been so richly gifted, we desire to give in turn. Maybe that's human nature. Maybe it's, it's that the things that we think we want aren't what we really want. And the, all of the consumption that we engage in is, is a substitute for the lost connections of our interbeing selves. First of all, I would like to um, respond to uh, your idea uh, that we are interbeings. And I would like to start uh, responding to that with a story of the Buddha. <clears throat> One day, Buddha is uh, sitting next to a pond. It's a lotus pond. And in a moment's inspiration, he picks up a lotus in his hand and holds it. And holds it. And holds it. And there are disciples sitting in front and they are watching the Buddha holding the flower. They say, why Buddha is holding this flower today? What, what is happening to him? And after a few moments, one of the disciples called Ananda, who is one of the chief disciples, very good memory, uh, he smiles at the Buddha. And when that shine from the eyes of Ananda comes across the Buddha, he smiles back. So it's a tremendous. When I came here, I saw lots of smiles in this room. And I said to Charles, there are so many smiling faces, <laughs> so you are getting it. <laughs> so Ananda smiled and Buddha smiled. And they were both looked very happy. And then the Buddha put the lotus back into the pond. And then Buddha went out away from it. But the disciples, the group of disciples, are still sitting there. And Ananda is still sitting there. And... Uh, then the disciples said, Ananda, we didn't understand what was going on between you and our master, enlightened master, the Buddha. What was going on? He was holding this lotus. What was it? And then you smiled. And then he smiled at you. And the Ananda said, 
that when the Buddha was holding lotus, I saw the lotus as an individual being, a flower, individual flower. And then I thought about it and I felt something and I realized something. The why Buddha was holding this flower today. And I saw Buddha in the flower. The flower and Buddha were not two separate things. They became one in front of my realization and imagination. And then not only I saw Buddha in it, but I saw the sun. For if the sun was not there, there would be no sunflower. There is no lotus flower, I mean. There was no lotus flower. And then I saw the mud under the, under the uh, pond. There's no mud, no flower, no, no lotus, no mud, no lotus. And then I saw air, and I saw water, and I saw humans, and I saw pond, and I saw the whole universe in that lotus. That's the idea of interbeing, mm -hmm. what you were talking about. So we are all made of each other. We are not separate beings, we are all made of each other. We are all related. Pay attention to your breath. And the breath you are breathing is the same breath which is sustaining the entire universe. All living beings, humans and other than humans, birds, animals, plants, trees, rivers, everything, mountains, everything is sustained by the same breath you are breathing. That's interbeing. We are all one. You are microcosm of macrocosm. The universe is within you. The entire universe is within you. The imagination, the creativity, this the spirit which you hold in your, in your body. Like this room has space. But is this room in the space or space in the room? Is the space in the room or room in the space? Both. There's a room in the space because all around there's a space. If you take these walls away, space will still be there. So we are that universe. If this body is like these walls, if you take the body away, we are the universe. All the imagination, all the creativity, all the uh, poetry, all your art, all your music, music of the universe. That's a beautiful idea of interbeing. Now, I would like to respond <coughs> briefly about this idea of restraint. I use the word which is in Jain tradition, we have this idea that dharma is based on three principles. We say it, dhammo mangal mukkittam ahinsa sanjamo tavo Deva vitam namang santi jasadhamme sayamano. That's a Sanskrit Jain text. What he says, the highest, highest way of being, the greatest way of being is practicing dharma. And what is dharma? Three principles of dharma. Ahimsa, which is non-violence. And that is relationship between myself and with other people. Should be relationship or doing no harm. If, if my action is doing harm to any other person, my words hurting somebody, I must not speak those words. That's no, non-violence. If my action is hurting trees, I must not act that. I, if I, my action is hurting my mosquitoes, even snakes, even wild animals, I must not do that. Ahimsa, non-violence, that's one principle. Sanjamo is a restraint. You take what is your need, the vital needs, celebrate, but not take so much that other people do not have. <coughs> take only what is your need, the other people that tena tek tena bhunji tha. Do you take what is your vital need, but leave other people's share for them as well, to celebrate and to enjoy. And tavo is tapas. That means practice something to reduce your needs and increase your spiritual needs. 
So there is no limit, no restraint, how much music you want to play, how much poetry you want to write, how much dance you want to dance, how much love you want to express, how much friendship you want to do, how much you want to walk in nature, how many flowers you want to plant. There is no restraint there. Every season, every year, new car model. That's not restraint. Every new year, there's a new uh, mobile phone. That's not restraint. Every year, there's a new, uh, new model of computers. That's not restraint. How many resources we are consuming in the name of this new, new, new models? So we have to have restraint. I'll buy a computer which will last for 10 years. <laughs> 10 years. A mobile phone, 15 years. Why not? Produce something which will last. When you are consuming material things, physical things, you have a limit. This body has a limit. And how much this body can take, even though the dinner table laid with all the cheeses and wines and food and drinks, everything. But you take when you feel full. And my mother would say, eat even 90% of your hunger and not 100%. 10%. So when you leave your dining table or your dinner table, you still feel that I can still eat a little bit, but I will not eat. And that will keep you healthy. Otherwise, obesity in the United States. Obesity in England, obesity in Europe, with no restraint. So restraint, frugality, simplicity, but elegance. We want elegant simplicity, not drab, not dull, not boring simplicity, but elegant simplicity, beautiful simplicity. This jacket I'm wearing, handmade, hand spun, hand woven, khadi. I've been wearing for 10 years, still lasting me. I don't need to buy every season a new fashion, this uh, what called catwalk, and go there and find, <laughs> find what is the latest jacket. I don't need it. It's a lovely jacket, keeps me warm, and why not? So make things beautiful, make things lovely, make things enjoyable, but don't have too much. Even the too much of good thing is not good. I think we have to be courageous and bold and embrace some of these old words and put new meaning, ecological and holistic meaning, and take in that way. When people really pay attention, like say with sugar, you know, if you really pay attention to how it tastes, how it makes you feel, um, you'll find that it didn't taste as good as you thought it did when you weren't paying attention. So maybe there's another path towards something that looks exactly like restraint. Maybe if you decide to really maximize your pleasure and really take that seriously, you'll discover that, that there are pleasures that you hadn't even noticed before. Um, and, and to me, you know, our, so much of our, of our civilization is based on control that I'm, of, I'm a little bit wary of any prescription that involves applying that control to, to myself. I'm always looking for a way, and I might be a bit dogmatic about this, um, uh, but I'm always looking for a way to, um, to come to the same place through more self-trust, more allowing. How do you bring that into the culture like you said, is that what I really want? Is that really my pleasure? How do you bring that? Unless you have some notion of limit. Mm -hmm. There is a limit, physical limit. There's no limit to, as I say, a spiritual being. Your mind can go as far as you want. But physically, you have to have certainly. You are in space, you are in time. Mm -hmm. You are in this body. And yeah. therefore, you have to have certain limits because of this body. But in your heart, in your mind, you can be wherever you want to go. So, I mean, maybe in American language, in American movement, uh, restraint word will not go uh, down very well. Uh, and, and I can understand that. And I'm not against pleasure and joy, but I am against this indulgence, which is going on at the moment in our society in India and here in England. And, and, and uh, not only sexual, but food and clothes and, I mean, if you look in people's houses, wardrobes are full of clothes and they don't wear them. Yeah. But they have a desire to have more, have more. How many clothes do you want? Shoes, 20 pairs of shoes in your house. There's no restraint. So how do you bring that culture you said, is this really joyful? Is this really pleasure, pleasurable? How do you bring that? Well, um, on, a, on a personal level, 
uh, I think that the way to bring that to people is to give them an experience that meets the underlying need that's driving the overconsumption. Because yeah. like, like you said, the closets are full of clothes, they never wear them, yeah. so obviously that wasn't meeting a real need. No, no. You know, They don't need that. What do they need? Why are they doing that? Yeah. Maybe it's because we're living in this commodity culture where we don't even know our neighbors anymore, where, where sharing isn't happening, yeah. and where you don't feel secure. Yeah. But in a gift culture, yeah. you, you feel secure because if anybody in that culture has more than they need, they give it to somebody who needs it. And so could you yeah. explain a little bit more how that gift culture will work? Uh, if you have, because um, at the moment what we are doing in society, uh, you go, you work, you get paid, and with that money you can buy a house, you can buy a car, you can buy a computer, you can buy what you like. Right. So that is a kind of system we have. Yeah. Now, if you, and that, that's where restraint doesn't work, because um, you have money, you can buy. If you don't have money, you can't buy. It's a more compulsion rather than restraint. And, and Self-discipline. Self and, and the things that you really need aren't available. Yes. Instead, there's just the things you can buy. Yes. And how much of the things that you don't need will satisfy a need that they can't satisfy? Yeah. An infinite number. Yeah. Like, there's no, there's, there's, there's no limit. And, and if you restrain that, and the real need isn't met, Yeah then that desire for the thing that you really need yeah. is still there. So how do you create that gift economy where uh, you are not dependent on uh, sort of physical uh, things which really don't satisfy you, but you go, go on accumulating? Yeah. Moving from that to a gift economy, that when I need it, I can get it from you, and you need it, I can, you can get yeah. it from me. The mutuality, how do you develop yeah. that? I mean, there's... On, there's many different levels to develop it at. You know, yeah. There's the, the personal relational level, yeah. there's the local community level, yeah. and then there's you know, a national or global level. Yes. And so the answer would be different on different levels. Yes. Um, but the general answer um, on, on a collective level is that we have to create uh, structures and institutions yeah. um, for sharing yes. so that people feel at home yeah. in the universe yeah. and they feel secure and that security doesn't come from how much they control yeah. how much they have and how much they own yeah. but it comes from how wealthy everybody is yes yes you know yes. and and how do we do that like primitive cultures had that mm. how do we translate that into a into modern, modern economy culture, I mean, that's yeah. what my book's about really yeah, yeah. You know, how do we bring the spirit of a gift yeah. into the modern culture yeah now on a personal level though we're all we all have the power <coughs> to give people an experience of of abundance of being at home in the universe yeah. Yeah. like any um, any act of generosity, yeah. uh, it, it doesn't fit into the world view of competing separate selves. Yeah. Like it, it, it's an anomaly. Like why did like I've I've had this experience before when someone is generous to me, and I can't fit it. Like yeah. this, these experiences really changed me. Even witnessing them, you know, um, I, I read about this uh, train wreck in Peru. Yeah. Okay? And, and so it's a remote area, and, and there's a train wreck, and there's no help anywhere near. This was a while, a long time ago. And, and the people on the train, the tourists on the train, they're going to die of exposure because it's very cold. Uh, but they didn't because the local villagers came with their blankets. Yeah. And the local villagers were very, very poor. Yeah. And they gave these stranded tourists their only blankets. Hmm. What, how, now, like, that behavior violates pretty much every law of economics that you'll read in a textbook. <laughs> like, why did they do that? Where, and I thought, where are they coming from? What perception of the universe mm. are they in that they feel confident and secure mm. to be able to do that? It must be a universe that I don't live in. Yeah. You know, and, and so witnessing things like that yeah. or experiencing a gift that, that's really big, it kind of, reminds me, because there's so many forces that are pulling me back into the small world of the separate self that say, you better just look out for yourself, Charles. You know, you better manipulate other people and make sure that it's all coming to you and, and be secure, right? There's so many voices that are telling me that. Internal voices that I've grown up with, external voices, the forces of money. And, and so in order for me to stay in the truth, yeah. which yeah. is inner being, yeah. I need help. Yeah. But one reason that we uh, don't have gift economy and the gift economy doesn't quite work because our societies have become too big. We have to change this urban uh, mass society 
uh, to more manageable yeah. human scale communities where people know each other and they can support each other, yeah. they can give, give to each other. I, I think there's always going to be some, um, some domains of human activity that will be global. Yeah. Um, but like today, a lot of things are global that shouldn't be global and don't have to be global. Like you know, food prep, food, food production that should be almost all local. Yeah, ninety-five percent maybe. Um, building materials should be local. Yeah. Um, most entertainment should be local. Yeah. Recreation, getting together to sing together. Like what happened to that? Uh, yeah. A hundred years ago, uh, entertainment wasn't uh, a product. Yeah. You know, you got everybody could sing and play an instrument. Yeah. You got together. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. 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 Um, and, and so we can reclaim a lot of parts of life. Uh, and reduce our reliance on you know anonymous strangers thousands of miles away. Yeah. Um, and the question still remains, though I think that that portion of life that still mm. it should be global. Mm. Like, how do we bring the spirit of the gift into that too? Yeah. We all want to eat, but very few people want to grow food. Hardly one percent of people in England are on the land. Yeah, but is that because they don't want to, or is that because economic forces push people off the land? Yes. Not only yeah. economic forces are put off the land, but also there's no dignity in mm. working on the land. Mm. If you work on the land, mm. that means you are uneducated, backward, right. peasant, farmer, laborer, you don't know anything, you don't know how to run computers, you don't know how to work in office. So if you're a banker, you get uh, 10,000 pounds a month. If you are a farm worker, you get hundred pounds a month, yeah. something like that. So there's and, no and, dignity. And, and that, um, that you know, low social status of farmers, that's yeah. actually another uh, expression of our story of the people. Yeah. Uh, because and it goes back thousands of years. Yeah. When social hierarchies first developed. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the lowest on the social hierarchy was was the farmer. Yeah. The highest was the king. Yeah. Whose feet were not even allowed to touch the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So we we. We developed this idea that, that higher is good and lower is bad. Yeah. Superior, like, why does the word superior mean better than? Yeah. Superior just means on top of. So, so this, this, this uh, uh, separation of humanity and nature that has been going on for a long time, it, it devalues things like farming or any hands-on work. Yes. Like a plumber has lower status than, you know, the engineer in front of his computer and the engineer is lower status than the theoretical physicist or yeah. the corporate consultant who works completely in abstractions. Yeah. Yeah. And so our economic system yeah. enforces this kind of cultural perception that that materiality is bad. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, yeah. and I think that when we say that the problem is we're too materialistic, I think it's the opposite. Yeah. I think it's that we're not materialistic enough. We don't see we don't nature value as sacred. Yeah. yeah, we don't value matter. And matter I think that when that changes... Wasted, <laughs> thrown and, away. And it's changing now because people are, are really coming back to the land, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. wanting to, yeah. Yeah. to... That's another way that we don't need kind of... And I, I, I would like to use the word sacrifice more consciously, but that it's not um, a lowering of our quality of life uh, to live in a more sustainable way, like people when they go start gardening, their quality of life improves. It improves, yeah. You know, yeah. it's like we're gonna have to make do with more, yeah. not make do with less. There's a bunch of different proposals. Some of them are pretty familiar to people, and some of them are not. Um, one of them um, is, I think here people call it a universal basic income uh, or a social dividend, mm -hmm. uh, which basically it says that um, the wealth of this planet and of thousands of years of accumulated culture and technology belongs to everybody. So everybody should get a share of that wealth, uh, which would take the form of uh, a basic income uh, that meets your survival needs uh, so that you're no longer uh, having to work in order to just survive, but you're free to do the work that your heart tells you to do um, that is an expression of your desire to give. So that's one one way to, to look at it. Um, I also t write about um, changing the way that money is created and circulates by uh, reversing interest. Uh, and um, it means it takes the form of a um, uh, liquidity tax on bank reserves or a negative interest on bank reserves. It was, a, it was proposed by an economist, Silvio Gessel, about 100 years ago. Um, practiced sporadically in a few places, um, and it's quite it's it's it takes a lot of uh, kind of 
uh, context <clears throat> setting for me to explain it. Um, and economically oriented people will think, well, wouldn't that cause overconsumption or wouldn't that cause inflation? And um, you know, how would capital accumulation work? And, and there's a lot of you know details to work out. But essentially, that um, induces more of a spirit of the gift because it makes money like everything else in the universe that it uh, decays mm -hmm. and returns to its source. So if you hold on to it, you don't get richer and richer and richer the more you have, but it, it would be like, like wealth if it took the form of, of, of bread. And I have a hundred loaves of bread and, I, and Maybe I'm a greedy bastard and I want to stay rich, but, but if I keep all 100 loaves, they're going to go stale and it'll be worthless. So if, purely out of selfishness, it's to my advantage to give everybody here a loaf of bread. And then and I'll say, when I'm hungry, I'll ask you for a loaf of bread. Yeah. And, and, so, and so why is it money like that? Hey, I've got more money than I need. Here, everybody here. Have a hundred quid, right? Why don't I do that? Please. <laughs> Money's not like bread. Absolutely. It doesn't decay. Yeah. So that's another proposal. Decay, yeah. And there's, there's a bunch of others. Yeah. That, that, it's very good. Yeah, yeah you yeah. should read the book.